I want to look at that verse one more time that says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. I want to preach from this thought this morning, for whom the bell tolls, for whom the bell tolls. It was my freshman year of college. As a matter of fact, it was my first week on campus at Morehouse. Before the semester began, freshmen were required to be on campus at least two weeks earlier for orientation. We had two weeks of orientation, 14 days to learn how to register for classes, learn the campus, meet our advisors. Now, all of my other friends at other schools had orientation for two or three days. But at Morehouse, we had orientation for 14 days. There's not that much orienting in the world. <laughs> and I was so excited to get to work, start classes, get my feet wet in college life, venture over to Spelman. And all of this, <laughs> and all of this orientation stuff was getting in the way. Just as I thought I had it all down one morning while it was still dark, I woke up while it was still about 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, and I woke up to upperclassmen banging on my door, yelling at, the, yelling at me. So let's go. The bell's ringing. The bell is ringing. Let's go. And I got out of my room, still in my pajamas, cold, still in my eye. And I walked out of my room to find everyone else on my floor in the hallway. In our pajamas, cold in our eyes, we could hear a bell ringing way off in the distance. And we got outside to find the whole freshman class outside in the middle of the morning. It was still dark. But before I knew it, we were running around the campus in the dark with tiki torches to find this bell and why it was ringing. We ran to the memorial of Dr. King, and there was an upperclassman there. He says, are you all tired? We said, yeah, it's 5 o'clock in the morning. He says, but the man who stands behind me was 39 and died with a 60-year-old man's heart, but you're tired. Dr. King died with a 60-year-old man's heart because the pressure he had experienced in his career stressed him out and aged his heart. For whom does the bell toll? And then we ran to the memorial of Howard Washington Thurman, a world-renowned theologian and writer who was responsible for reading the Bible to his grandmother because she could not read because it was illegal for slaves to learn how to read. But before he became a theologian, he read all the books in the library at Morehouse. For whom does the bell toll? Then we ran to the tomb of Benjamin Elijah Mays, considered one of the great schoolmasters of history. And then we found out that Dr. Mays had to leave his home as a child, going against his father's will. His father didn't believe that education was important, but he had to go against his father's will and became one of the greatest presidents in history. For whom does the bell toll? And finally, we came across this bell that was sitting on the campus. It's a deep bronze bell that sits 10 feet from the, the ground on the lawn where there was a Civil War battle. And that bell was ringing as a student kept ringing it and ringing it. And we found out that that same bell was once used on that campus to, nail, to tell the campus that there was trouble nearby. And when the Ku Klux Klan was traveling down Atlanta, they would ring the bell to let the students know that there was danger nearby. For whom does the bell toll? But I still wasn't sure why it was ringing in the middle of that night. It was a reminder to us 18-year-olds, free from home, free from our mother's womb, free from our father's glance, that we were now on a new journey in our lives. But just before we thought we were free to be college boys, just before we thought it was time to have a party in Atlanta, we had to remember that there was danger still nearby. Before we went out to waste our money and time on parties and college life, we had to be oriented to the reality that it's a good time to be alive, but there's still danger at hand. And this week, I could, I could hear that bell ringing and ringing, and it would not stop ringing. This week, the whole world watched as there was a lynching of a man outside of a convenience store in Louisiana. We saw a man killed while his wife was in the passenger seat and his four-year-old daughter was in the back seat. We saw his, his daughter trying to comfort her mother. And just miles away from Morehouse, a black man was hanged in Piedmont Park in Atlanta. This week, 
George Zimmerman is trying to auction off the very gun that he killed Trayvon Martin with to start a legacy for his grandchildren. Dylan Roof, who walked into an AME church during Bible study and killed nine people, and yet now his lawyer argues that it is a state case and not a federal government case, and so they want the judges trap. for the days are evil. and the National Rifle Association that vehemently advocates for the right to keep and carry arms has absolutely nothing to say when black people who have a license to carry are killed for no reason. But they, these days, are evil. They forgot to warn us that only white people deserve to carry arms, not black people. But this is not just grown folks' business. Because over and over, we see that children and babies are having to deal with trauma and grief that adults cannot even bear. There's an article in today's New York Times about young people who have witnessed violence and trauma so closely that we are now raising a generation of children who distrust authority. The presence of police officers does not make us feel safe. Sometimes the presence of police officers triggers trauma. A 15-year-old who has to wail for his father's death. To Mayor Rice's teenage sister who has lost 50 pounds after watching the video of her brother killed. Oscar Grant's five-year-old daughter who is traumatized so much so that when she sees the police, she asks her friends to dodge and to duck. Sandra Bland's nine-year-old nephew who started sleeping with his mother since his, mother, his aunt died in a jail cell. And let's not make the issue about out there and down south because the blood is still on the hands of the New York City Police Department. And the death of Eric Garner, whose wife and five children are forced to see the video over and over again, the man who murdered him is still on the payroll, but yet the man who took the video is now serving four years in jail. The days are evil. And we find in our text this morning, Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. It's a young congregation of believers who know all too well what it is like to live under the threat of death and violence. Just like us, here we find a people whose day-to-day -day existence is a game of life or death. They're not sure will they, whether their children will come home or not. They're not sure whether they will make it home from work. And here is a community that knows all too well how it feels to have your friends and family killed by state-sanctioned, state-supported, state-funded, state-employed genocide. And this is why Paul tells them, put on the whole armor of God so that they may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He doesn't have time to get deep about evil and theodicy. He's given them practical wisdom for how to live in evil days. And what happened this week in Louisiana and Minnesota and Georgia and Texas was not God's will. But God's will is only revealed in how we choose to respond to evil. And the question that beats upon us this morning is where is God in all of this? What are we supposed to do? Paul gives his waiting congregation straightforward, practical advice for living evil days. Indeed, the days are evil, but what Paul tells him in this letter is that there is still hope. There is always still hope. Paul tells them, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. So be careful how you live. Be mindful of your steps. Don't run around like idiots at the rest, like the rest of the world. Instead, walk as the wise. Make the most of every living, breathing moment because these are evil times. And we come from ancestors that know what it's like to live in evil times. But yet they fought back against evil by controlling the way they spent their time and their money. Mothers and grandmothers who spent time instilling wisdom and faith into their children and grandchildren. Fathers and grandfathers who taught their sons the skills of a trade so that the next generation would benefit from their work. And the first thing that Paul tells them to do is don't get drunk. right before the boat ride. Don't get drunk. 
but get filled with the Spirit. And Paul tells them, don't get drunk because it's evil, right? Times get tough, but make sure that you are taking care of yourself. Living a healthy life is a matter of life and death. And what good is it for us to demand justice in a larger society while we are abusing and mistreating our own bodies? Paul was warned that these were evil days, but he also knew that he was talking to a people who had a problem with drinking. And evil doesn't just manifest itself at the barrel of a gun. It manifests itself through the continuous trauma and stress that eats away at our day in, day in and day out. Mental illness is a reality in our lives and in our own community. You can't be exposed to videos of deadly shootings all day, pictures of dead bodies on the newspaper, four-year-olds comforting their mother and not be mentally affected by it. Mental health is an American crisis, and it plays out in so many ways. Soldiers coming home from war, children living with trauma, toxins in the air, and the bell is ringing this morning for our nation. The nation that pours all of its money in policing and prisons rather than mental health. Police officers are called, police officers are called to protect. Mental health providers are called to care. But our city and nation continues to leave mental health care as a responsibility for police and correction officers. <laughs> Cook County Jail in Chicago is busting at the scenes with inmates, not because they're criminals, but because the jail is the largest mental health provider in Chicago. People who have mental health conditions in Chicago have to commit a crime in order to get the medication and counseling that they need. So that's why they keep going to jail, because that's where the medicine is. That's where the counselor is. And it's safer for me to be in jail than it is to be in the street. The times are evil. And the enemy knows that he does not have to kill you in the street. The enemy knows that he can kill you by stressing you out. High blood pressure, overeating, lack of sleep, not eating consistently, keeping you up worrying at night. Self-care is resistance, black church. But he also tells them, not, don't just get, don't stay away from alcohol, but he also tells them, let's make sure that we stay together. Because in order for us to speak to one another, we have to be in the same place on one accord, whether that's in the church or out in the street in the protest. And don't you think that you have, don't think you have to go through evil days by yourself. Don't sit at home watching these crazy videos. Get out and make sure you stay connected with other people. You can clap. And Jesus understood this. He didn't call the 12 disciples just so they can work. He called the 12 disciples because he needed some friends. He needed some homeboys and some homegirls to help him with the work. Stay together, talk to each other, and don't let the media pull us apart. It is pointless for us to sit around and argue whether or not Black Lives Matter is like the civil rights movement. What would Dr. King do if he was here? It's pointless to get into a debate whether or not the old school is better than the new school. It's not either or, it is both and. Two chapters, but the same struggle for freedom. Two battles, but the same war. The same fight, two different generations. Where is Dr. King? Where is Malcolm X? They're gone. But the bell tolls for us to serve our present age to fight the battle that stands at our doorstep. For whom does the bell toll? The bell tolls for thee. Freedom is not a final state of being. It is a consistent, ongoing fight. The battle of the 60s, the battle of the 60s legitimized black demands. Now the legitimacy has rolled away. At one time, it was hot to be racist based off of the color of your skin. But our enemies are smarter than that. They know now we call it colorblind. So now you can't put your finger on it. 
And we have to be smart enough to know when it is time to move on, but to also stick together. But lastly, Paul says to the church, whatever you do, keep on singing. Whatever you do, keep on singing. Whether it's Mahalia Jackson or Kendrick Lamar, whatever you do, keep on singing. Paul says, make sure you speak to each other in songs, in spiritual songs, in hymns. Don't let the evil and anger of this moment rob you of the ability to sing. Keep a song in your heart. Our ancestors in every generation understood the importance of music in the struggle. You can't have a movement without music. You can't demand justice without music. Music is the exhaust pipe of the soul. That's why they took music out of schools. You can't have a movement without music. Don't let evil days rob you of your worship. It is in worship that we come together as a family to encourage each other as we worship God together. In the deep woods of slavery, our ancestors did just that. After a long day of work and bearing the yoke of slavery, they would steal away into a hush arbor where they prayed and sang, where they learned how to read, where they took care of each other where they planned escapes and discussed parables. The times were evil, but they understood the importance of staying together and singing together. And that's why they would take quilts and they would damp the quilt in water and hang it up just to keep the sound out so they could praise God. Let's go down by the river. Go to lay down my burdens down by the riverside. Whatever you do, don't stop singing. God can handle our praise, God can handle our worship, but God can also handle our anger. And it is not right for us to come to church and act like everything is okay. All throughout the Old Testament, we see people who were angry, who knew what it was like to be in exile, who knew what it was like to be in bondage. And understand this, their deliverance always came after they were willing to be honest with God about their pain. Oh God, oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? By any means necessary. And I'm closing, but Abyssinia, I wish I could tell you that being saved means that you are safe, but it is not true. Just because your soul is saved, it does not mean that your black body is safe. I wish I could tell you that if you live right, you will be safe, but it is not true. You can't stand in front of the store and not be choked to death. You can't sit in Bible study and prayer meeting and not be killed. You can't play your music too loud. You can't go to the store for a snack, and now you can't reach for your driver's license or re registration without being killed. I wish I could even tell you that if you vote in the next election, we will be safe. But the, fa the reality is that the times are evil. But I take hope in this one thing, that God still knows. God still knows how to give birth on evil's doorstep. God still knows how to give birth to evil on, how to give birth to liberation on evil's doorstep. The Roman Empire was out killing everyone who was not like them, stealing money from the poor, taking control of the temple, running amok in the streets. Yet Jesus understood that he could not spend all of his time trying to change the hearts of people who didn't want to be changed, ignorant people who did not want to be educated, racist people who did not want to be open to diversity, bigots who did not want to be open to accepting, hateful people who did not want to love. Yet instead, he learned how to redeem the time. He spent his days teaching the illiterate, caring for the poor, mentoring disciples, teaching people how to fish, setting women free, giving a voice to the voiceless, healing the crippled, raising the dead, feeding the hungry, disrupting bad news with good news. Here he was giving people a new vision of the possible, expanding their imagination of the limited, showing children that they were valued, telling new stories, giving hope, and they killed him. They killed him not just because he was a good man. 
They killed him because he was bringing light to a people who had walked in darkness. He came giving a song to a people who were in despair. He came setting captives free. He kept showing them an excellent way. And what I am saying, Abyssinian, black people, my people, we may never dismantle racism in America. We may never disrupt white supremacy. Evil does what it wants to do. America has always been America. And if she doesn't want to be saved, don't save her. But I am telling you that we cannot kill ourselves trying to destroy a system that makes, living, uh, makes a living off of killing us. God still knows how to give birth on evil's doorstep. In the face of murder, he gave Israel, Miriam, and midwives, and Moses. In the face of injustice, God birthed prophets and priests to speak truth to power. In the face of danger, he birthed disciples. Don't tell me that God won't give birth in the face of evil. In the face of evil and bigoted racist empires, God came through 42 generations and wrapped himself in flesh to handle evil face to face. And in the face, and in the face of segregated seating, he birthed an Abyssinian and a Concord. In the face of mediocrity, our ancestors gave us new values of black love and black excellence and black joy. The times are evil, but God can redeem the days. God will give us a new vision. God will give us a new dream. God will give us a new plan. God will give us a new hope. God will give us a new song. God will give us a new ministry. God will give us a new business. This is what we do, and this is how we do it. This is who we are. This is the Lord's church, and Jesus is Lord. This is the church that has been established by his word. This is the church that loves its builder, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. I am the Lord's church, and Jesus is Lord. You are the Lord's church, and Jesus is Lord. We are the church that loves its builder. The gates of hell shall not prevail. This is the Lord's church, and Jesus is Lord. God will redeem the times. God will redeem the times. God bless you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.